Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our June meeting, Native Plant Society of Texas, Williamson County Chapter. We are going to have, as always, our short business meeting. And then we'll have our speaker for the night, which is gonna be Landscaping with Native Plants with Leah Turner. Here we go, our plant of the month is milk, pearl milkweed vine. This is over at a friend of mine's, mine's house. Usually you see it uh, along Rivery Park uh, Trail down there and some other places. But uh, this is uh, in a garden bed up on a nice trellis. And it has these very, very beautiful heart-shaped leaves that are uh, a little bit fuzzy. And then the flower itself, this is a nice tiny flower, maybe the size of a quarter. And it gets its name from this iridescent pearl center here. And then it's got this beautiful green veining in the flower too. And there's a lot of small flowers all over this, this vine. Uh, so it's a gorgeous vine, very, very good to use as a woodland edge at a woodland edge type garden. And let me see if I can get that out of the way. Okay, and very high and deer resistant. It is a milkweed. It's a milkweed vine, and so it is a host for both the queen and the monarch butterflies and very high in deer resistance as all the milkweeds are. Our Nipsot State COVID policy has been updated. Uh, the chapters can now follow the CDC guidelines. We're also allowed, because this is a statewide edict, we are allowed to set our own rules as being stricter. So uh, even though CDC has opened things up pretty well, uh, we, we have a choice on making things stricter based on uh, conditions in our area for COVID. But uh, right now, I don't know that we're doing anything. So activities, the uh, field trip committee has met or is going to meet later this month. They are planning some new field trips and uh, these are being planned. So next month, we'll be able to tell you what's going on. Chapter activities, uh, we also continue with our native plant gardens doing monitoring and maintenance. And then the uh, ever uh, present Charles Newsom doing the invasives removal down at Berry Springs Park and also at a couple other locations. So uh, I just wanted to say thank you to Mary Washman for volunteering to take over monitoring and maintenance, maintenance uh, of the Georgetown Public Library. As always, we will have volunteers, a call for volunteers to come out and help us with various weeding, planting, mulching, et cetera. So, but Mary uh, passes by that way and said she can keep an eye on it and let us know when it needs attention because that's an important garden for us. Uh, we also want to thank uh, Agnes Platino and Marilyn Purs, give you a little bit of background. That garden, they've been taking care of this garden since 1998. And this uh, started at the old library with a, a group of people that got together and did a garden there. And they collaborated with City of Georgetown and the, and the public library. But the uh, Agnes and, and Marilyn have been the face of Nipsot for us for all these years. And in January in 2014, the new library was opened up and they put in the normal uh, junk food landscaping. And when we, they went down and finally convinced them that they needed the native plant garden back. And we were able to take out all the uh, junky plants and put in nice native plants. And that has been uh, updated several times. And when we update that garden, we also update a brochure, which is available online through the library. Uh, it's also available at the library. And there is a sign there with a QR code on it, which you can take your phone and I will take you to the garden map. And then uh, the brochure is also available on our website. So thank you, Agnes and Marilyn. And I just want to let Agnes and Marilyn know 
that if they show up to our fall plant sale, they'll be receiving a special treat from the fall plant sale. So uh, we, we, we couldn't begin to repay them for all the efforts they've put in over the years. So uh, let's see, nominations are still open. They will be closing on June 14th. We uh, have a committee that is working and we'll, we'll have a full roster for, vote, for voting. Voting will be by mail. You'll hear from Pat, Pat Donica on that when the time comes after, after the nominations are, are closed. So um, please, if you wanna nominate yourself, you can send me your name, uh, tell me what position you want to be nominated for. And also uh, you could nominate someone you know that would be a good fit. Uh, I prefer if you have their permission before you nominate them. If not, uh, either way actually, the committee would contact them and make sure they're okay with it and talk to them a little bit and see if they're a good fit for that position. Uh, same with you, if you wanna nominate yourself, we'd just like to chat with you a bit, find out uh, how you feel about uh, a certain position and how you would fit in. Uh, upcoming programs in July, we're looking at uh, the field trips committee is going to do some, uh, they're planning a couple of videos uh, on some of the trails and trail signs, which are always fun to see. And then we uh, also will have some presentation on uh, field trip related things. We have, uh, in August, we have foraging for edible plants in Central Texas. September, we're holding that slot open uh, to be in contact with somebody and uh, see if, if show. We're hoping to be live. So we've kind of held that open to uh, have a live speaker at that point. Um, it's possible in August, but I doubt it. Uh, certainly by September, we'll, we, we'll, we'll be live. Uh, we went ahead and uh, got together with our, our speakers and uh, had to fill and needed to fill out the year. In October, we're having the Humane Gardener. She is in Maryland, so she will definitely be by Zoom. But by that time, we should have all our technical kinks worked out and be able to have a Zoom presentation, but also a live meeting at the same time. So that'll be interesting. Uh, and then restoring habitat in Texas to pr protect our native pollinators. And we're not sure what to do in December yet, but we're hoping to have some sort of party and it may be bring a, bring a bag lunch kind of thing or something, we, we don't know. I'm making this up as I go. Whoops, what happened? Pardon me a minute. There we go. Uh, Tried to swipe instead of tap, that doesn't work. We are the Williamson County chapter for the Native Plant Society of Texas, and you can find us on our own blog. Our blog is on the website. Members and non-members can sign up for our email notifications. We don't share your information. YouTube, you can find all our past presentations uh, since we started doing Zoom on YouTube. And this one will be posted in about one to two weeks the one tonight, so if somebody misses it, they can catch it uh, down the road there. Uh, we're also on Facebook and Instagram talking about what we'll be doing for activities, et cetera. That, uh, hmm. <laughs> Pardon me, I forgot to put my phone on silence. Uh, I don't know why it's doing that. I don't think we're seeing anything, Randy, other than uh, your icon changed. Okay, here we go. So if you would like to join the Native Plant Society of Texas, go to nipsot.org. Uh, please specify Williamson County chapter or one of the other 35 chapters in Texas. You might find one that's a little closer to home, but you can also join uh, affiliated chapters and be in more than one chapter and receive uh, information from, from ourselves, as well as uh, maybe you're in the Houston area and the Houston chapter's a better fit for your 
your plant selections, et cetera. Uh, last month's winter, win, winter in May for the book was uh, Paige of Georgetown. And she won the same book we're going to give away tonight. This book is uh, you uh, out of print, but you can find it used on the internet if you're uh, not a winner and want to get a copy of it. We're really uh, pleased tonight to have Leah Cherner from Delta Dawn Gardens. She's a landscape consultant, does design maintenance uh, company in Austin. Producer and co-host of the Horticulturi podcast, along with Colleen Dieter. Uh, many of us know Colleen Dieter as well. She's come to speak at our organization before. And she also, Leah, Leah also teaches garden design at the Austin Community College. So we appreciate the, uh, Leah coming very much tonight. And I think I just unshared. And so Leah, you can share your screen. Hey. Everyone stay, stay with us a minute while we switch screens. All Not right, Randy, yours is still sharing. Just I can stop it. Second. Okay, good. All right, so let me just go into Keynote. And here we go. Sheesh. Hmm. We promise it worked okay, uh, there an we hour go. ago. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. I guess I'm ready to start. Um, everyone can see the screen okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, so my name is Leah Turner, and um, I am going to talk to you about 10 landscape design principles for home gardeners. Um, we already got a little bit of an introduction to me, so I'll just kind of run through this quickly. Um, I am a landscape designer in Austin. I have a company called Delta Dawn Gardens that I started in 2015. And I specialize in, um, you know what, hold on, let me move that, okay. Consultation design and installation. Um, and I'm really excited about uh, wildlife habitats, dry creek bed designs, uh, reducing turf grass to make room for native plants. And I really like to work with people who are passionate about plants and ecology. So I think that I'm excited to talk to this group for sure. And um, I also wanted to tell you guys a little bit about this podcast that was mentioned at the top. Um, it's called the Horticulturati, and I do co-host it with Colleen Dieter. And we talk about all kinds of topics related to design and gardening and ecology. And so just for examples of some recent episodes, we talked about the history of the uh, functionally extinct American chestnut. We talked about uh, how the USDA hardiness, uh, the cold hardiness map got drawn up. Uh, we also talked about the snowpocalypse. We talked about owls, all kinds of different things. So um, if you're into fun uh, nature topics, check out that podcast. And I'll go right into my presentation. So I just wanted to start with a little disclaimer. And uh, that is everybody's style is going to be different. Um, design is very subjective. Uh, my style is pretty informal and naturalistic and your style may be more formal and that's okay. Um, so your style is your style. We'll start with that idea. Um, and if anybody, you know, if nobody ever tested the principles of design, then everything would look the same. And I think that would be pretty boring. So let's talk about what some of the principles of design are. I put this in a spooky font because uh, this phrase design principles is one that tends to freak people out a little bit. Um, you know, there's this mystique around design that can be intimidating. And um, 
you know, I was kind of skeptical about, about thinking about design principles, even when I started teaching planting design, um, because a lot of the books about landscape design that you'll find, they come from the East Coast or the West Coast or England. And these are all extremely different climates and extremely, you know, places with extremely different seasons than ours. And sometimes in Central Texas, it feels like, you know, the best we can do is just keep things alive. And um, so sometimes some of this advice that we get from these design books can be irrelevant to us, but um, there are some great design principles that we can apply here. And I um, also just wanna say that, you know, composition, design composition is something that takes practice. Uh, like flower arranging or any other art, you know, but there are tricks that designers use and I'm going to share some of those with you. So kind of how this presentation is going to work, I'm going to talk a little bit, bit about conceptualizing your space. Then we're going to talk a little bit about plant selection and then plant arrangement. Okay, so my first principle is start from the top down rather from than the bottom up. Design around your trees. So a lot of times people will say to me, I want to thin the canopy of my tree to give more light to the beds because they're thinking about the plants underneath the tree. They want those plants to have more light. And they're thinking from the ground up. They want to change the tree to fit the plants underneath. And I will challenge that. And I will say, well, let's think about the trees first and then think about everything else in the landscape because trees are the largest, longest lived, most valuable plants in the landscape. You know, they do so much for us. Trees provide shade, they reduce our electricity costs, they anchor the soil, they prevent stormwater runoff and erosion, and they create a sense of beauty and scale around the home. So I really wanna think about prioritizing trees first and foremost, and this actually, this way of organizing the landscape actually makes it a lot simpler. So when I say it makes it simpler, I just mean you can use the trees as a guideline for how to arrange the beds in your landscape. Um, this picture is from uh, Maddie's on Live Oak Street in Austin. It used to be Green Pastures. And they have these gorgeous mature live oaks and they've, you know, they've arranged all their planting beds around these oaks. And um, if you, it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but um, they've left a portion of the root zone undisturbed um, by mulching. Can you guys see my cursor? Anybody? Yes, we, yes can. we can. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, and then they've planted these native sedges underneath as a ground cover. And um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a nice, pleasing composition that is also good for the trees. And so I mentioned uh, mulching around the root zone of the tree. So just wanna give a quick comment about considering the root zone of trees. Um, it's a really good idea to minimize the damage to tree roots by leaving a portion of the root zone undisturbed and mulched. Um, and one thing that a lot of people may not know is that this is how trees grow. Um, their roots are shallow and very, very wide. They usually extend at least as far as the outer edge of the canopy, but oftentimes two to three times that far. So we want to think about protecting tree roots as part of the design, but it's never going to be, it's not usually going to be practical to mulch this much of an area. So the idea is kind of to just think about the, the roots that are closest to the tree trunk. Those are the ones that are the most sensitive. So it's a good idea to just leave a little space mulched around the trunks um, if you can. Okay, now this is the Native Plant Society, so I'm sure nobody has this situation, but um, having, you know, turf grass, uh, you know, exotic turf grasses like St. Augustine, Bermuda, Zoysia, um, not a great uh, thing to have growing all the way under your trees. Um, for one thing, you can risk uh, mechanical injury to the roots of the tree or the trunk by mowers and trimmers as seen in this picture. And um, 
also these exotic turf grasses will compete with the tree for nutrients and um, that can give, you know, that can stress out the tree. Here's another picture. Um, this just drives me crazy. Um, putting rocks all over the trunks of trees um, is really bad for trees. Um, gravel absorbs a ton of heat and it raises the ground temperature. That really stresses out the tree roots. It also compacts the soil, which makes it harder for the roots to get their needed air and soil, um, sorry, air and nutrients and water. So um, please don't do that. Okay. Instead, you know, take cues from nature because in their natural habitat, most trees grow with a wide variety of companion species. And if you walk in the green belt or on any, you know, nature preserve trail, you'll see dozens of species of ground covers, perennials, you know, understory trees that naturally grow together around larger trees. So as far as designing around trees, um, when I start a design, I will start by um, kind of creating a two-dimensional drawing of the space, and uh, I will start by placing the trees, plotting the trees on the design. And so I will kind of figure out where the trunk is, I will figure out how big the canopy of the tree is, and then I will start with that for my drawing. So that is literally how I start with the trees. Um, I will, uh, you know, once I figured out where the trees are, you know, um, then I might, you know, have a little bit more information about where the most sun and shade is going to be. Um, and um, that will help me with uh, coming up with a plan that works. And so um, in this picture, this is the final drawing for this little space. Um, these big circles are the trees, three big trees. Um, then here, this white area is a little mulched area around the trunk. And then we have plants arranged, um, you know, compatible species planted underneath the trees and um, outside of the canopy a little bit more uh, sun and a room over here. Um, so that's just kind of a, a way to get you thinking about how to start with the trees and, um, and kind of looking down in a bird's eye view um, kind of perspective. Okay, so my second principle is when you're laying out beds, use curved and irregular lines for a naturalistic look. Oblong shapes or kidney shapes work really great. Um, curved lines can fool your eye's sense of scale, which can make spaces appear larger and backgrounds more distant, which is often something we want to do in a, um, in a residential landscape context. Um, and curved lines are also easier to maintain than straight lines. Um, and in my opinion, you know, I think too many straight lines and too much rigid symmetry can make a space feel cramped. So I'm a big fan of irregular shapes, curved lines. All right, number three, disguise boundaries. Spaces look more confined when the edges are obvious. Now we're always gonna have to work around straight lines in the landscape because we have buildings and we have walls and fences and walkways in residential lots. Um, and what we wanna do is kind of soften those hard lines and edges using plants. Here's an example of a layout of a, sorry, this is a bed layout that doesn't look very naturalistic because it has too many straight lines, in my opinion. Um, here, I've kind of highlighted some of them. This fence line has this kind of harsh horizontal and the posts of the fence um, have, uh, you know, kind of a harsh vertical line. And then it's all echoed by this, uh, this big, horizontal edge here. And to me, this just feels kind of um, out of proportion. And when I look at this, all I can really see is the fence. And so that brings me to the next 
principle, which is that like something is missing from this picture and it's going to be part of the next principle, which is consider the vertical plane. So when it comes to conceptualizing your space and choosing plants, you always want to consider the height of the plants as much as the spread and you want to have a diversity of height layers in the design. So what I mean here is we have some like low plants, we have this tall tree, and then we have all this space here. So let's back up for a little bit better view. Um, this is shows you a little bit better. This is that bed back here and then there's grass and these three trees. Um, and again, what you have here is some very tall trees that have been, you know, limbed up so that they're, you know, their branches are up very high and then some very low growing perennials and grass. And, you know, this fence is just so obvious um, because you're missing that um, kind of mid height layer. So this is a concept sketch that I did for this design. What I wanted to do was extend the bed to include these trees and create a new curved edge. And I also want to incorporate plants of varying height to kind of soften the edges and hide the fence. Okay, so this is the, this, this picture here, this is drawing that I showed you earlier. This is the design for that space. Um, and you can see how I added the curved, new curved edge here, but what this two dimensional picture does not show you is the relative height of the plants. And that is kind of a shortcoming of planting diagrams in general. Um, you know, you miss a lot of information um, when you're thinking in the two dimensional uh, idiom like this. And so one thing that I'll do just to help myself is I'll make a lot of lists when I'm doing a design and I'll organize plants by height so that when I have my final plant list, you know, I know that I'm utilizing the vertical plane because I have enough plants that are the right kind of heights that I want them to be. Okay, here's a picture of that design installed. Um, this is, you know, the plants are all really small, so it's, uh, they don't look very big, but basically, you know, we planted understory trees and shrubs and perennials that eventually will fill in all of this space. Um, both horizontally and vertically. Um, and here's, here's another shot of that. It's got a Mexican buckeye, some dwarf palmetto, sedges, etc. cetera. Okay. Um, another kind of idea about thinking about the vertical plane and thinking in three dimensions, maybe playing with topographical variation. So this picture is of the roof garden of Austin Public Library's downtown location. And it's really amazing what they have done in this garden. They've taken a flat roof on the sixth floor of the building and they've created this big berm to give you the impression that you're in a hill country landscape. Um, and using berms does require a bit of care um, just to make sure that the stormwater runoff um, is under control, but done correctly, berms can really create a sense of drama. This is a picture of a, a little miniature rock garden outside of a bank that I saw in Durango, Colorado a few years ago. And it's just a beautiful uh, little composition of uh, use, you know, just a great example of how to use the vertical plane effectively and to play with elevation on any scale. This is like a very tiny little, these are like little tiny sedums. Um, but you can look to alpine gardens or rockery gardens for inspiration when you want to play with topography. Okay, so we've thought in two dimensions about the, you know, the layout of the trees. We've thought in three dimensions in terms of not just width, but also the height, the vertical layer. And now we're gonna think in four dimensions. And we're gonna think about the fourth dimension being time and seasonality. 
So of course you've heard it before, you wanna consider the flowering and fruiting time for plants and incorporate species that have blooms and interesting foliage and bark and berries at different times of year. Um, of course, you wanna consider, uh, you wanna integrate evergreens and deciduous plants together. Um, in this photo, you've got Dahlia gregii, which is evergreen. This little blue stem is dormant, but it has a pretty, I think really nice looking dormant form. And you've got some blue bonnets coming in and the blue bonnets are, you know, kind of a clue that you aren't limited to just mixing evergreens and deciduous plants because here in central Texas, we are lucky to have a whole category of summer dormant native perennials in our palette. These are plants that pop up in the fall or winter after the um, deciduous trees drop their leaves and then they take advantage of the increased light um, under the, the you know, canopy of the trees. And um, they bloom in spring and then they go dormant in the summer heat. So they're not evergreen, but they're green all winter. So they're really useful in livening up, livening up the winter landscape. And I took all of these photos just like weeks after the freeze or you know, immediately almost after the freeze. And you'll see that these plants were just doing great, even blooming. Um, heartleaf skull cap, just amazing. Did it really well during the freeze, looked gorgeous. Um, of course, spiderwort, columbine, um, the violets are always really nice. So I love these summer dormant um, winter green plants because they kind of, give us another uh, tool in our toolkit to use. Um, another wonderful one, this is a native, um, well, they're all native, but this is soft hair marble seed, which is really um, strange and unusual. And I haven't really ever seen it for sale in a nursery, but I've seen it um, growing wild. And I know that uh, the, the Wildflower Center sale will have it sometimes. And uh, it's a really cool plant that is evergreen, um, has this evergreen rosette during the winter, and then has these very strange white flowers during the summer and it grows in the shade. It's really cool. Um, some other, you know, ways to incorporate, you know, year round green in the landscape um, is to think about plants that have evergreen rosettes, you know, um, like the cut leaf daisy, Inglemann daisy. Um, that's the one that, you know, it's been blooming uh, the past, you know, couple, several weeks, months almost. Um, it's got a yellow flower on a tall stalk. Um, and of course the purple cone flower also has a nice evergreen rosette. And then I have a picture of a yucca here. Um, just an example of, uh, you know, how you can use evergreens and wildflowers. You know, the annual um, wildflowers that we have are mostly going to be um, providing some really nice green in the winter, like the blue bonnets. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about combining plants. Um, my sixth uh, design principle is mix it up with the variety of plant shapes. So when we talk about plant shapes, that is what designers refer to as form. So form is the overall shape of a plant when it is in leaf. So there's many different groups of forms that these plants can take. Um, they can be cones or mounds. They can have a they can, they can have a weeping or an arching habit, or they can just be upright. Um, the prickly pear, of course, is a very irregular shape and the agave as a, a vase or a fan shape. And um, a variety of shapes creates a lot of interest. So, you know, just for an example, you can use um, spiky or upright or column forms to create drama. Um, this bald cypress and this Texas uh, palmetto are very uh, striking in this landscape. This is at the uh, Zilker Botanical Gardens in their prehistoric garden. 
Um, and when it comes to plants with strong forms like these, a little bit goes a long way. Um, and by contrast, uh, softer, rounder forms can create a sense of calm, especially when repeated. So these soft mounding forms look really great when they're massed in a large group and they kind of balance out those plants with upright or spiky forms. Have some water real quick. Okay, this is a quote from uh, Pete Aldolf and Noel Kingsbury um, in their book, Planting Design, that I really liked. They say, any system of combining shapes is about creating balance between contrast, which generates visual stimulation, and harmony, which creates a feeling of rest. And that is one of their designs in the UK. So here's just some examples of kind of playing with different shapes to uh, try to strike a balance between contrast and harmony. Um, you have in this picture of some spiky dwarf palmettos and uh, some mounding copper canyon daisy here and then some muleys that have more of a, a weeping form. Here, um, this, uh, this red yucca has a very strong, spiky, dramatic uh, kind of exclamation point vibe. And the, uh, the Selvia gregii and the snake herb in the front here are a little bit softer. Um, uh, the, the Selvia gregii stands up more upright and the snake herb is a little bit more trailing. So you just get an idea of, of some of the different ways to combine shapes. And you can also mix it up with textures. So when I say textures, I'm referring to the leaf size of the plant. Um, in general, uh, coarse textures are gonna be plants with big leaves or big flowers. And fine textures are gonna be small, uh, thin leaves. So like this maidenhair fern, uh, this possum haw, the bamboo muley, live oaks, all of those would have, it would be a fine textured plant. So you wanna combine textures. Here's some examples of that. Um, we have the muley has a very thin, fine leaf and the apuncha here has a, a much uh, big, um, uh, what did I say? Let's see. Coarse, yes, the big coarse leaf. And um, the this Greg Dahlia is kind of, uh, has a very fine little uh, leaf um, and uh, you get kind of a, a bigger leaf, a uh, coarser leaf from this mealy blue sage. And of course here, the Sotol and the Lantana, it's a great combination in terms of both texture and form um, the soft uh, mounding lantana and the spiky, um, bold, so tall, just look great together. And here's another um, combination that uh, grows wild, um, that you'll see it uh, underneath uh, ash junipers. And it's wonderful because this is a, this is a great dry shade, evergreen combo uh, the agarita and the Mexican silk tassel. Um, they have uh, just leaves that really complement each other. Um, the Mexican silk tassel has a very uh, big leaf. Uh, the agarita has a very fine pointy leaf. And um, it's, this is just a great, I think it's a great combo. And uh, I also just, I think that um, the Mexican silk tassel is another one that's hard to find in nurseries. And I really wish that it was more commercially available because it is such a useful plant. It's, you know, for a full sun evergreen that has a good height, um, you can't really beat it. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about arranging plants. Um, in general, um, 
you want to arrange plants in odd numbers, quantities of a species. So start with groups of three or five, and this is just kind of common gardener lore. Um, and the reason for that is that, you know, an irregular cluster of plants usually looks more natural than uh, you know, straight lines or block shapes um, arrangement. And if you look at the guidelines for composition for most visual art forms, be it photography or painting or flower arranging, you'll often see that asymmetrical arrangements are more um, visually appealing, visually appealing than symmetrical ones. And using odd numbers gives you that asymmetry to start with. And so in this picture, we this is at the Wildflower Center. We've got three, four, five muley grasses here. Um, we've got like one big dramatic clump of this Rudbeckia, I think it's a, that big giant coneflower. Um, and then it looks like, you know, maybe a group of three to five of these black eyed Susans. Um, so, you know, this is just kind of an example of that. Um, that uh, odd number quantities. And number nine, um, arrange plants in triangle or zigzag shapes rather than square grids. This is the same picture. And you can see how they've done this. These three um, muleys are in a little triangle shape. It doesn't have to be plants of the same species. You can see that they've they've organized these um, coneflowers and uh, Breedbeckias and um, well, I can't tell what that is, but they've arranged them in kind of a triangle shape. You could also call it a zigzag shape. And let me show you um, what I mean by zigzag. So this is what I would call zigzag spacing. Um, they are kind of off of a rectangular grid. And then when I look at this, this rectangular spacing, to me, um, it just looks very um, unnatural. And, uh, you know, the space between the plants is so much more obvious when you have a, a rectilinear grid than when you have more of a zigzag or, a, you know, a triangular triangular planting uh, arrangement. So that is what I have about um, arranging plants. And I have one more design principle, which is, you know, leave room for spontaneity because plants have their own agenda and they will surprise you. And, um, you know, whether you have a design that you've done on paper or a sketch that you've done, or you've just kind of planned it out in your mind, a design is only ever a concept. It's not a blueprint um, because you are collaborating with nature rather than conquering it. So um, it's always good to leave some room for spontaneity and uh, happy accidents. So that is all I have. And we, I guess we can do questions. Sure, we, sharing. we have just two. Um, all right. Uh, so, so from early on, you had a, uh, you showed your first image of your design. And so Gay Kriegel asks, uh, what design software do you use? Or is that hand-drawn? That's hand-drawn, yeah. Okay. Watercolors and all. No, I use markers. markers. Okay. <laughs> Good. I don't know any any <laughs> software. <laughs> All right. And then uh, from Betsy Ferris, uh, this question was related to when you were talking about the mulching underneath the trees. Oh. And so she asks if mulch around the trees could cause the roots to rise higher. Um, she was thinking that that happened to some of her neighbors. Hmm. Yeah, I see the question. Let's see. I don't think so. I think that the I think that the roots are just growing. Um, the roots, you know, get get wider every year, just as the same way that the trunk does. And I think that's probably what's why the 
why the roots are expanding um, beyond the level of where the mulch is. Okay. All right, and there were just a couple. That does make sense. Um, and we've got two more questions there towards the end. Uh, can you talk more about spontaneity? Yeah, I mean, um, let's see. What did I say about spontaneity? Uh, I mean, I I find that when I do a design, um, it's one thing on paper, and then uh, I when it comes time to install it, there's always a ton of little changes that happen at the time of installation. And then a year later, there's always a ton more of little changes that, that just happen naturally. And it seems to be um, just part of working with a natural living medium is that you have to kind of roll with the punches. And of course the, you know, very big uh, punch that we got this year was the, the late freeze or the, not the late freeze, but the, the historic freeze followed by, um, you know, ton of rain, you know, it's just the, the weather has been so crazy. And um, I feel like it's just, you just keep learning every, you know, learning every year more about, more about plants and just having to, having to roll with the punches. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah, it's hard to define spontaneity in some ways. Uh, yeah. So we've got a question from Pam Peck. Uh, how do you use color in, in your designs? Hmm. I, um, I don't have like a really formal approach to using color. I don't um, really you know, think about the color wheel and all of that very much when I'm designing. Um, but I will tend to kind of pair things together in terms of bloom colors that I like to be together that'll be kind of complementary. Um, I will, uh, you know, because uh, purple flower and a yellow flower are always going to look really nice together. Um, if it's, if it's a shady situation, I like to use, you know, maybe like a white flowering, um, salvia coccinia, the tropical sage, a white or a white mist flower, um, you know, plants that will have, um, really light colored whiter blooms in the shade can kind of brighten up the shade. Um, Let's see what else. And then, you know, it fits a sh another, you know, really shady situation where we're mostly using foliage. I will try to, you know, contrast um, different shades of green against each other. Um, but yeah, I don't really have a, like a, I don't really have a philosophy around color at all. <laughs> okay, that's perfect. All right. Um, and then let's see. We had a question for Marianne Cox. Is the triangle or zigzag the same as diagonal planting? Uh, about Thomas mm. Rainier talking about and planting in a post wild world. I would imagine so. I need to look back at the book. I don't remember that. Um, him, I don't remember what his definition of diagonal planting was, but I think it's probably the same concept, actually, because. Um, I, I really like his, his ideas a lot. And so I would probably, maybe I copied that from him. <laughs> Just absorbed it. Yeah. Um, so we do have a comment from Lena Dion with a oh, that's link a good one. Uh, about, uh, you know, root flare and the health and not smothering them. So I felt yeah, that's a, that's a great, um, that's a great point that when you're, when I say mulch around the trunk of the tree, I mean, not put mulch up up against the trunk of the tree. Leave a few inches, you know, leave two inches of space between the trunk of the tree and the mulch. And also make sure that um, there's not a lot of soil or mulch or um, even really ground cover um, that is uh, putting a bunch of moisture up against the root flare of the tree or, you know, covering it up. Cause yeah, it's really important to, to let the 
the root flare um, be exposed to air. And you touched on maybe this next question from Agnes about uh, seeing that mulch piled <sighs> up, which we refer yeah. to as volcano mulching. It's very frustrating. And, and folks don't know what we're talking about. It's you get the, the tree branch and then the mulch just kind of sits all the way up on, on that yeah. branch. And that can cause lots of problems. Yeah, it can really, it's not good for the trees. Um, I wish that people would stop doing that. I don't know. I don't know how to, you know, I just, I don't know how to get people to stop doing it that way. You know, the city does a really good job. The city does a really good job of mulching, you know, it, like in, Z in Zilker Park and everything. Um, it's, it's great, but yeah, a lot of commercial installations and stuff, they'll just dump a bag of mulch right on the tree. <laughs> okay. And then uh, from Betty, I'm going to mess up your last name, Betty Sains. Uh, do you amend the soil a lot or do you pretty much leave it natural when you're doing your plantings? That's a good question. I don't amend the soil usually, but I do like to use um, compost when I'm planting, usually as like a top dressing. Um, and uh, I like to, um, I like to use leaves, you know, leaf mold is a really great uh, amendment for soils and it's free. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm usually gonna just work with the soil that is, uh, that is there because the problem with, you know, amending the soil or trying to control the pH or anything like that, it's only gonna be temporary that you're gonna be able to change that. So. You know, I try to really match the plants with the soil. And fortunately with native plants, you know, that's that's usually pretty easy to do, you know. Right. Okay. And I guess you probably touched on that a little bit with the, the next question. Oh, there. about fertilizing? Yeah. yeah, no, I don't put anything. Um, I don't put anything in the hole um, when I'm planting. Usually I don't even put compost in there. Um, just because I want the plant to really acclimatize to that that space and not uh, not try to stay in its little hole, you know. I want it to branch out and just get used to that soil. Okay, very good. And then uh, looks like uh, another question from Verena. Do you Ooh. have any advice on <laughs> Bermuda grass? Ooh. Uh, um. Bermuda. Actually, it was on That's keeping the limiting the neighbors Bermuda from invading. Mm -hmm. So is there any kind of barrier you can put in to keep Bermuda from getting in your yard? No. I don't think there is. The roots go down like 18 inches or more. Yeah. Out red. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, okay. it's hard. It's really hard with Bermuda. Um, you can try to solarize it to kill it, um, but you're probably going to want to, um, yeah, it's, you can't really use like an edging to, to keep it out. Um, you might have to talk to your neighbor <laughs> about eradicating some of that. So at least you have a little barrier between where their Bermuda ends and your yard begins. Yeah, the only thing I've been able to do is I, I put in a rock border and mm -hmm. I bury that some, but then I, and then I mulch just inside that so that I can actually dig out the Bermuda or spray it with a uh, Bermuda killer. Honestly, one other thing is plant a tree because there's one thing that Bermuda can't take is shade, you know? So if you increase the shade, you can reduce the Bermuda. That's a good point. Good one. All right, uh, we've got time for just one more. Let's see. Let's jump down to Susan. Uh, materials for natural walkways, what do you suggest? Hmm. I suggest um, mulch is always great. Um, I, uh, let's see. Sometimes um, gravel is good. 
Um, but sometimes it can, like I said, raise the temperature a little bit. So, you know, if you have a really hot space, you might actually want to go with a mulch, um, cedar, uh, what's it called? The cedar mulch is really good for that. Um, cause it ha has a little bit of a, um, weed suppressing property about it just because it has some, you know, natural chemicals in that, in that wood, um, then um, as far as gravels go, um, I think that granite is not a good um, option usually because weeds love to grow in it. Everything loves to grow in decomposed granite or crushed granite. Um, so I've seen people use, um, if you want like a gravel type thing, um, I've seen people use uh, uh, what's it called? Limestone screenings. It's very, very finely ground up limestone. And, you know, because it's pure limestone, it's so alkaline that um, it does have a little bit of a natural weed suppression. Um, but then, you know, you can also do, you know, flagstone pavers are really nice and you can plant things in between the pavers like a horse herb or sedges. Um, I think all of those would be good good natural walkways. Okay. Well, Leo, we definitely thank you for your time tonight. Uh, it's just at eight o'clock. Uh, for those of you, if you didn't have your questions answered, uh, you know, reach out to me at the end of the meeting and I'll pass those along to, to Leah. Um, so thank you, Leah. Uh, Randy, is there anything that you want to add? Uh, no, that was, that was great. We appreciate all your uh, input tonight. All right, thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks, Leah. Thanks, everyone. Everyone have a good night.